Welcome to Savvy Business, Life Unscripted, with your host, Christina Rivera, where our guests share their wisdom and valuable business tips, empowering our audience to expand their personal potential. Hi, Gina Burnett. Welcome to Savvy Broadcasting, Life Unscripted. You are calling in from Blue Foot engineering.com. You are a, a pioneer in the aerospace industry doing amazing work. And you're going to share about that today. But uh, I love how you got started and uh, choosing your wonderful mascot, the blue, blue foot. Uh, we see a little beautiful penguin on your website. So share a little bit about your backstory so people get a hand on where you came from and how you got to where you are today in creating uh, blue foot engineering. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll try to make this succinct. I, I came into aerospace, not um, the typical pathway, majoring in engineering um, or something like that. I actually started out my life as a biologist and a science educator. Um, and for the first part of my career, I ended up working in a lot of different nonprofit education um, outfits, most recently the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And through that uh, vehicle, I did programs and curriculum in all different kinds of science disciplines. And whenever I had the opportunity to develop a space curriculum, I would pull in my dad, who is the consummate lifetime aerospace engineer and astrophysicist. And I would bring him to train the volunteers, give them a little bit of uh, behind the scenes information about what it's really like to work at the space program. And I was always really proud and fun for those moments. And then in 2009, an opportunity presented itself for my father to purchase a small aerospace education company that he thought would be a fun father-daughter hobby project, me bringing the education uh, and entrepreneurial side and he bringing all the engineering necessary. And um, I was a stay-at-home mom at the time. When I was mm -hmm. time to hit the work first full force again, uh, I turned it into a full-time job. And once I really started engaging in the aerospace ecosystem and industry uh, fully, I was smitten just absolutely enamored with the qualifications and experience and intellect of the people I hobnobbed with every day. So I was addicted immediately, uh, moved forward a few years past that. In 2017, I met uh, another woman, uh, aerospace consultants, and we became fast friends. And we started noticing a, a niche that had not been filled, at least particularly here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. A little background, Colorado is one of the biggest aerospace states in the country. A lot of people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. We have the highest per capita aerospace employment on, in the country. Wow. And of course, we have many, many years of military installations, Department of Defense, big primes like Lockheed and Mark mm -hmm. Ball. Um, but people don't realize is that we also have hundreds and hundreds of small companies that feed those primes mm -hmm. and where the innovation is really happening. Mm -hmm. And my partner and Amanda and I decided to launch Bluefoot to be a, an umbrella network to capture and find some of those really interesting niche, unique engineering specialties, machine shops, component developers out there that mm -hmm. could really help the larger aerospace ecosystem succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, but there needed to be somebody to connect the dots. And so we saw Bluefoot Engineering as that uh, Maybe Angie's list for engineering, if you want to yeah. sort of uh, <laughs> summarize it as fast as possible. So that was Bluefoot Engineering. And, uh, you know, the blue-footed booby is a communal bird. Each bird has its own job, all to reach the success of the entire colony. And uh, we just thought that was a fun story. Mm -hmm. We like to wear pins that say, ask us about our blue-footed boobies. And um, <laughs> it always just starts a fun conversation. And we're woman-owned. And it's, you know, just fun all the way around the board. Where do they get the boobies from? They're naming them that uh, is, is from Spain. You know, as a former marine biologist, I should know this, but there's a whole, uh, you know, just like there's multiple kinds of falcons. Wow. Yeah. Or raptors. There's multiple kinds of boobies, and I'm, I'm not sure where that yeah. comes from, but they all have colored feet. And just a so they're not just all blue. Space, but but no, yeah. no, no, they have red-footed ones. And an interesting thing I discovered after we incorporated with that name, I had some fun and I went back to the museum and was talking to the zoology curator and explaining to him where we came up with the name of our new uh, company. And so he had to take me down to the zoological specimens and show me all these um, stuffed birds. <laughs> and he pointed out that they actually have to paint their feet because it, like the iris in your eye, when, when the blood stops flowing, the color goes away. So 
All the blue-footed boobies and red-footed boobies that you see in a museum exhibit, their feet are actually painted because the color goes away when they die. Just as interesting fact. I didn't know that about, uh, you know, that happens to eyes as well. That's so interesting. Now, you know, you had told me, interestingly, when you got started, my dad was a super fan of all things science and space, uh, aerospace engineering and stuff like that. He was not an engineer. I think if you could come back and start his life over again, he would have gone into that field. But one of the things he used to read on is what is NASA up to? What are they doing? And so he used to talk my ear off at like five years old. Here's what NASA's doing. Here's the experiment. I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're right. saying. <laughs> <laughs> so you and your dad, you worked together. Did you have that kind of relationship growing up? Did he share science with you all the time and get you intrigued in, into that whole world? That's a, it's a funny that you asked me that because if you had seen us, like put me back at age 12 or 15 with him helping me with my science homework, it usually ended with both of us in tears. Oh. So the fact that we ended up working so well together later on in life, I attribute to me maturing a little bit, but also the fact of the matter is I was the boss of the business. So I think that went well, but I definitely was, my future was definitely shaped and rounded by those early experiences. I had a space shuttle lunchbox when all the other girls had strawberry shortcake. Um, but I also had amazing things happen. Like Sally Ride, the first female American mm-hmm. astronaut was a close personal friend of my father's. She came to a barbecue at my house. Mm-hmm. Blown away. I mean, that's like the Hollywood elite of NASA. Yeah. And I had experiences like that throughout my childhood that even as much as as a young person, I might have wanted to distance myself and, and do my own thing. Of mm-hmm. course, I ended up coming back around to that because what amazing experiences, especially growing up in a small town in Iowa. I mean, yeah. I think what intrigues everyone, whether anyone listening in today, a business owner thinking, well, I don't really have an interest in space, but I think everyone had this idea of exploration because it's in the human heart to explore, to learn, to grow. I mean, we, we explore the seas. Now uh, a good portion of uh, humans are going out to space and exploring there. Where right. do you see uh, Bluefoot helping the aerospace industry go and expand? How, how do you see you fitting into that and your company? I think that's a great question. And I thank you because it kind of, uh, Uh, points back to what our business model is. Uh, We are purely design consultants. So we are purely on the front end. You have a crazy wackadoodle idea (laughs) and you have some funding. Generally speaking, nobody ever has enough, but you bring us in because most new companies can't possibly have every discipline in house that they need to fully realize an idea. And that's, what's been so amazing for Bluefoot is that we've gotten in on this new age of commercialization of space Most of our customers are young, startup, revolutionary thinkers, sometimes maybe too risky of thinkers, and we help them with that as well, too, about where you need to rein it in. Mm -hmm. But getting to the moon, boots on the moon 2024, Mm -hmm. that was the uh, goal of the last administration. We'll see if we still get there. Um, Boots on Mars. Oh, yeah. Before you can do all of that, there are a whole bunch of revolutionary technology innovations that need to happen to make those baby steps to get there. And I think Bluefoot is on the front line of working with those up and coming Mm -hmm. technology organizations that are, yeah, developing woohoo ideas about how to do things different, whether it's a totally different kind of rocket propulsion Mm -hmm. or, um, yeah, rocket propulsion, perfect example. How do you get more power out of your solar uh, solar arrays. It's those things that probably sound mundane to somebody not in there. But if you can make a big change on the number of watts or voltage you can get a, a solar array, that's revolutionary change. Mm-hmm. So Bluefoot is really advancing those ideas. And what's amazing about aerospace is all the little bits of moving forward, it, it doesn't happen all at once. It's just like when right. you go have a big goal, and someone said, oh, my, my New Year resolution, blah, blah, blah. You know, right. And to get from A to Z, it does, it's not a one-step process. And the same with humanity growing and expanding into the universe. It's going to take time to grow where we can actually have our forefront, not just in our backyard around you know planet Earth, but go forward and outward. Exactly. If you'd allow me, because it was such a beautiful segue to get on a soapbox that I have just for a second. Go for it. Um, We mentioned earlier in the broadcast that I did not come into the aerospace industry through a traditional pathway. I came in from a completely different career. Um, And I just want to point out to anybody, your father would have been a perfect example. You don't have to be a rocket scientist or a physicist or an engineer to be involved in the aerospace industry. It takes everything from actuaries and accountants to uh, industrial design engineers who are developing the most ergonomic, comfortable space seat, Mm -hmm. to psychologists who are going to help identify a team that can live together for 18 months without killing each other, (laughs) Um, 
to even just the staff that do the upkeep in the buildings where all these technical innovations are happening. So I just like to say out there, you know, maybe being an engineer is not in your future, but I guarantee if you're excited about aerospace and especially as there is much going on right now, especially if you live in Colorado, you can get yourself a job in an aerospace company and just learn from observation. That, and I love that you said that because uh, early on I was working at a company many, many moons ago. Uh, you might know it, Associated Press. And it's funny, my cubicle, I'm an accountant back then. There you I'm go. An and I'm sitting there and my whole back wall, every single wall, because at AP, one of the things I loved is they had um, the photograph department, which is photographs from 60, 70 years, 150 years worth of photographs that they've taken. They have on archive. I got like 150 photos of NASA and the Hubble telescope. So my whole okay. wall was Hubble telescope, you know, um, nebulas and whatever. And people would walk by and the, I think you're at the wrong company. I think you need to work. Wait a minute. That's the most interesting <laughs> accountant's office I've ever seen. <laughs> it doesn't look like an accountant office, but I love that you say that because anyone like my dad or anyone else who has this deep desire to get involved can right. help towards our, our move forward. Right. Yeah. So you you had mentioned early on, just before our interview started, that you don't just find great, amazing talent, but you find like the unicorns out there that other people might not find. And you know how to seek and 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 get them for the perfect company and match them up. How do you go about doing that, finding the unicorns? That's a good question. And, and it's sort of a multi-pronged thing. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my other um, uh, soapbox things that I get into is um, if you base something purely on somebody's academic talent, for example, if I was only recruiting based on your GPA and what college you went to. Mm -hmm. so you have to be from MIT with an A. <sighs> You're missing such a breadth and wealth of talent because there is such a difference between academic knowledge and putting into practice mm -hmm. a theory. And so I pride myself in particular for finding those students that were maybe BC students because mm -hmm. they just couldn't really get into the homework or other yeah. lab exercise that had already been performed 29 times. So they knew the outcome wasn't going to be anything new or interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but they could come to the table and really engage and brainstorm and, and then see something through with a good work ethic. That's what's most important to me. So I start with the universities that I interact with. My closest relationship is with the Metropolitan State University of Denver. That's where my office is. We've had a long time public private partnership. There's other universities in Colorado mm -hmm. that are great as well. So I start with the student body mm -hmm. and I start with, if you want to intern for me, guess what? It's not a paid internship. You mm -hmm. get credit. Yeah. And that weeds out a whole lot. Now, it would have weed me out, for example, back in the day. I wouldn't have done an internship if I hadn't gotten paid. But what I find is I have these students who are legitimately so interested in learning and putting into practice what they've learned in their classes that they're willing to do a job mm -hmm. for the credit. Yeah. And so and I say to my students, if I hire you, I guarantee you, you will have a job offer at the end of your internship. Mm -hmm. Whereas you might get an internship at a larger company and you might get paid a $15 stipend an hour but you're not guaranteed a good job at the end of that. I mean, yeah. you're closer than somebody who didn't have the internship. Yeah. So there's part of that is relying on this interface with universities. I also have several friends that have been in the industry forever who are always looking out for me. Mm -hmm. Everybody that's in the Bluefoot um, family, mm -hmm. everybody knows everybody somehow. I've never just plucked somebody out of the sky and added them to our group. It's somebody yeah. who's recommended to us by another Bluefoot family member. So you yeah. know what? I've been working with this person. They're ready to do some moonlighting or they just graduated. Or they're working on their PhD and they need a little filler. Everybody, we all know each other and we're all vetted internally. And so mm -hmm. we have common ground and common respect. And I think mm -hmm. that's huge. You know, and that's a really important thing. I remember early on, there was a certain job I was looking for in my young 20s, and it was in the kind of social help and psychology arena, and I didn't have a degree yet. But I had told everyone around me, including my friend who was a psychologist, here's what I'm looking for. And one night she invited me to a party just before Christmas. Everyone was psychologists, doctors, whatever. And I just started networking, talking to them, ta talking about my fascination, and I got hired as a volunteer. But the the experience you gain from that is just I mean, I used it for all parts of my life going forward in my work experience. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that is in it, the experience you get from being an intern. It's just, yeah, it's more than second to in none. Pocket. Yeah, second to none. And you know, they say it's all who you know. When I was younger, I took that to mean who did my parents know? Were they in a country club or were they in a partnership mm -hmm. at a law firm? I look at it differently now. It, it is who you know, or it's more of who'd you put yourself in front of? 
Mm. What opportunity, you know, and I'm working with mostly engineers. So the joke in the engineering world is how do you tell an introverted engineer from an extroverted engineer? Well, an extroverted engineer looks at your shoes while they're talking to you. Okay. So these are the people I'm working with. And so they're not necessarily excited to go do a social, a social networking event or be on a panel discussion or volunteer for something. But if I can help nur- nurture them or mentor them through that path, once they're in front of somebody and they have name recognition, mm-hmm. huge difference when it comes to the hiring. Yeah. And, and you, yeah, it does. And you mentioned something very interesting with finding someone beyond what's on the paper or the credentials, because uh, one many years back, I was going for a job and it required a certain thing on my resume, which I didn't have. And he was like, well, why should we hire you? You don't you haven't gone to school for this particular part. And I said, but, you know, I like to educate. I like to learn. I like to grow. And so I said to him on the side, I just I hire a math tutor just for fun because I like mm-hmm. to learn math. And I didn't realize that the guy sitting before me was a math, a math um, graduate. And he said, really? And they started throwing these equations at me and we started jamming math for the next hour. Nice. And of course I got the job, but it was because, you know, sometimes just looking at just the paper in front of you, yeah. this person is much richer and deeper than what's before you. And sometimes you got to ask different questions or, and, and also as the interviewee kind of put forth more right. than just what's on the paper. Which in this day and age where there's more and more computer algorithms sorting through resumes, and if you don't have the exact 10 words in the exact right order, you get kicked out. It's unfortunate, yeah. but all the more reason why you need to pound the pavement and put yourself in front of people who you can say, yeah. um, uh, hello, remember when we met at Space Symposium? Thank you so much for the opportunity. I've put in my resume, if you would be willing to go find it and, and flag it so it doesn't just go through the system and lost. Yeah. And that's not going to work every time because not every uh, VP at Lockheed or Ball or Sierra Nevada is going to take the time to help out a recent grad. But when it happens, it changes lives. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I, I really thank you, Gina, for coming today to share this great wisdom. I don't want people to leave without finding out, let's say, that they're a small engineering company or they want to find out how they can help grow humanity into the stars. How can they get a hold of you? Uh, www.bluefootengineering.com or Gina, G-E-N-A-H, yes, the name of a star at bluefootengineering.com. Would love you to join our ranks. Would love to in, get you into Colorado Aerospace Ality where it's all happening. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's nice to be a part of the breadth and depth of experience of all of your other guests that I saw. I'm really proud to be here. Oh, thank you so much, Gina. It was a blessing having you here today. Thank you so much for coming to Savvy Broadcasting. Thank you. Like, subscribe, and share this episode. To listen to more Savvy episodes and Savvy Biz Tips, go to www.lifeunscriptedradio.com. To find out about our paid sponsorship opportunities or how to become a guest, email Christina at lifeunscriptedradio.com.